So the first one is on, uh, the topic is digitizing audio. So um, the main reason for converting audio to the digital domain is it's very convenient for storing and transmitting audio data. And um, the main promise of, of digital audio is that we can store and retrieve the information transmitted over large distances and through many devices with very little loss of quality. So that's the main reason. So all audio um, starts out as an analog waveform, uh, typically music or speech or content of some sort. And to, to be converted to digital, there's a, a process called analog to digital conversion or A to D converters. So A to D converters digitize analog audio by sampling the waveform. The number of bits uh, determines the accuracy of the analog waveform or the resolution of the measurement. And then various sample rates are used depending on the signal bandwidth. The sample rate must be at least double the highest frequency within the band of interest. And the, the sampling clock must be precisely regular. So here in the graphic we see a uh, representation of an analog signal, which is some sort of a waveform, and, and it's continuous in time. And we break it up into discrete time at these sampling insta instants, which are related to the sampling clock or the, the sampling frequency. And then at each sampling instant, we take an estimate of the waveform signal and convert it to a number. And this series of numbers at regu regular sampling instants um, is a representation of the signal in the digital domain. So the first process is called sampling and the second process is called quantization. So together, sampling and quantization are used to digitize a signal. So the sample rate uh, is an important concept. It's sometimes abbreviated as F sub S or the number of samples per second. You can, uh, you can talk about it interchangeably as samples per second or uh, hertz. So 32 kilohertz or 32,000 samples per second, that's used for broadcast, particularly in Europe. 44.1 uh, kilohertz is a very common uh, format that's used for music, and that was the, um, the sampling rate chosen for CDs when they first came out <coughs> back in the 1980s. And then uh, 48 kilohertz is a very important sample rate. It's often used for professional audio quality, um, for uh, digital video transmission audio, and just about everything else. It's a very common format. And the reason for the, these two rates of 44.1 and 48K is that, remember we said um, the sampling frequency has to be twice the frequency of the signal of interest in the baseband. And um, human hearing uh, works from about 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz, 20,000 samples per, or 20,000 hertz. So these, um, that 20,000 hertz fits nicely into these two sample rates of 44.1 and 48 kilohertz. Now, lower rates are often used for voice-only data, uh, s such as 8 kilohertz and 16 kilohertz. And the, c the common format for digital telephones now is 8 kilohertz. It has been for many years. And that's because a lot of the information in speech um, is contained within the bandwidth below about 3.5 kilohertz. So you'll notice if you talk on the telephone, the, the voice quality is not very good. Um, but if you use something like Skype, voice over internet protocol, it has a higher bandwidth typically, and the audio quality is, is noticeably much better. Now there are higher rates uh, available such as 88.2 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz, 176.4, and 192. These 88.2 and 176.4 are multiples of 44.1, and 96 and 192k are multiples of 48 kilohertz. So currently, um, AES3, which is the standard for digital, the uh, digital interface, and IEC 60958, these standards support 22.05K, 24, 32, 44.1, 48K, 88.2, 96, 176.4, and 192K. Uh, 
in addition, there are variations of this that divide by 1.001 for sample rates that fit more easily into uh, video formats like NTSC. For example, 44.1K divided by this magic number of 1.001 becomes 44.056, which fits into NTSC video frame. Now, a recent development is sample rates of 384 kilohertz and higher. Um, I don't know if you, I think you use the, the term here, high resolution audio. Uh, is anyone familiar with that term? You raise your hand. Um, it's, it's very popular in Japan, and I've been asked to speak about it in Japan, which I'll be doing on Friday this week. And I had never heard the term before, um, but apparently, High resolution is audi audio is anything that is higher than 44.1 kilohertz and greater than uh, 24 bits. And the uh, recently there's been a lot of interest in uh, sorry 384 kilohertz audio, and uh, we've just announced I think this week uh, a new um, higher sampling rate for our digital serial interface. We can now run at sample rates up to 432 kilohertz. I'm not sure why people want to do it, but that's what they want to do, so we made it available. Okay, so aliasing I is a term for unwanted signals uh, produced from the signal being sampled in the sample rate in use. And this, um, sometimes you'll notice this if you see uh, a movie of a, of a rotating wheel and it looks like the wheel is moving backwards even though it's moving forwards. And that's a a type of aliasing in the in uh, imaging that is similar to imaging, uh, sorry, to aliasing in audio. So this happens whenever the uh, the signal exceeds um, half the sample rate, which is called the Nyquist frequency. So you can see in this representation we have a signal that's a sine wave at low frequency, and um, if if there was a signal present at this higher frequency. Sorry, it would, it would occur at the same sampling instances in time. So when you look at a spectrum of this, the signal uh, shows up beyond the Nyquist frequency and it folds back. And we'll be looking at this uh, a little more during the seminar. So for uh, analog to digital converters, uh, early de designs prevented aliasing by using very sharp um, analog cutoff filters. Um, now these analog filters, although they work, they produce serious phase errors, um, especially at high frequencies. And currently the, the technology used is oversampling. So you, um, you use a much shallower filter and you oversample by a, a higher rate. If you want to sample at uh, say 48 kilohertz, you might sample at 192 and then digitally filter the signal um, down to the required bandwidth. Now we mentioned the, uh, the resolution or the number of bits and this is the number of uh, steps in the, in the waveform that we break the signal into. So for example, um, more bits um, adds more resolution and there's the, the dynamic range of the signal increases by about six decibels for every bit. Every bit allows you to double the number of steps in the signal and uh, a doubling um, corresponds to 6.01 dB when expressed in terms of decibels. So 8 bits is uh, 40 dB of range. That's used for voice quality. 16 bits has at best about 96 dB of range, and that's uh, CD quality. 18 bits is 108. 20 bits, 120 dB, and 24 bits, 144 dB. So the, the current standard for most interfaces is 24 bits. The uh, AES-3 interface, um, such as digital, unbalanced, or, or SPDIF, uses 24 bits maximum. And um, there's always, it seems, the uh, desire to have greater bit depth. So um, in our analyzers in the digital serial interface, we support up to 32 bits of resolution, which is really quite high. And uh, resolution is always a good thing. When you, when you break the signal up into more steps, you get a better representation, and the signal is preserved as you pass it through uh, digital signal processing algorithms. And uh, you also have more headroom if the signal is recorded at a lower level than maximum full scale. <coughs> 
Now we're going to talk about dither in the next um, presentation. I think that's it for. So quantization, breaking the signal up into uh, steps, causes error. And the error is typically not noise-like. It varies with the signal, and it, at low levels, it's highly audible. You can hear it. Dither is noise that's added to the signal uh, at quantization, and it converts the quantization error to noise. It doesn't cover up the quantization error. It eliminates it. So the result is you have an, a higher noise floor, um, but it's not correlated with the signal. It doesn't modulate the signal, and it sounds somewhat analog. So it, it sounds better. Here's an example of some signals. Um, this is a signal at 997 hertz. This frequency is often used for audio test because one kilohertz is the middle of the audible spectrum. And um, you don't want to use a frequency of one kilohertz exactly because it's a, a sub-multiple of the sampling rate. So typically we choose uh, 997, which is a, what do you call it, a prime number, I guess. And it doesn't divide easily into sample rates like 44.1K or 48K and multiples of those. So you can see an undithered signal at 997. This is at minus 80 dB relative to full scale. And you can see these very discrete uh, peaks in the spectrum that are um, quite high. And if the signal is low like this, that's only about 30 decibels below the signal. So if you, if you put a lot of gain into the circuit to bring that, that signal up, you would be able to hear these peaks quite audibly. So adding dither to the signal uh, raises the noise floor, but it takes away the discrete peaks in the spectrum, and it's less audible. It's more pleasant sounding. So in um, quantization, we have the concept of resolution. So for each sample taken from the A to D converter, the amplitude is rounded to the nearest step. We only have discrete steps, and we have to break the signal into one of those steps. The, um, the width of the word, or the number of bits, um, sets the dynamic range and the quantization error. So the more bits you have, the less error in, this in the signal, the more steps that you have. You, you take a continuous analog signal and you break it into steps, and if you have tiny, tiny little steps, you have less quantization error. The size of the steps is set by the word width or the number of bits. So for example, um, in 16 bits, you have 2 to the power of 16 steps which uh, corresponds to 65,536, so roughly 64K steps. And each doubling um, increases the dynamic range by 6.02 dB. So for 16 bits, you have about 6 times 16, or 96 dB of dynamic range. So the you can um, measure two signals at the, at the same time that are 96 dB apart in level. That's the concept of dynamic range. Now, the minimum possible quantization error for a perfectly linear uh, analog to digital converter is one half of a step. So in 16 bits, that's 1 over 2 to the 16, or 1 over 131,000, which is a very small number. Now, when dither is added, we have quantization noise because the signal has a noise-like characteristic. It's the continuous sample by sample stream of these round-off errors. Am I going too fast, too slow? It's okay? All right. Okay, so this represents quantization error. So we see the, the signal here, and Q is the quantization interval. So in the middle of these um, lines would be where the signal is sampled. So you can see um, at each point, uh, these are sampling instance, which, which are sampling instances, which are 1 divided by the sample rate in time, 1 over Fs. And at each location, um, the signal has to, has to be rounded to one of these steps. And this introduces an error here between the signal and, um, and the quantization step at each location. 
So as you can see, um, the graph below shows the error at each sampling instant. So, excuse me. So you can see the the signal here, and here we have the uh, this would be the the steps defining the signal, and here we have the error. So we have nine samples of a small analog signal uh, across seven quantization steps. Steps are in the vertical direction. The samples are in this direction. Okay, so the, qu the quantization interval Q is 1 over 2 to the power of the number, number of bits. And the sample period is 1 over the sample rate, so the sampling uh, instance in time. Now, a very low uh, amplitude analog sine wave, which has a peak-to-peak -peak value that's less than the height of the quantization step. So the this, these two lines in here in red represent um, the steps in the A to D converter. And if the signal is below that step, it will never cause the converter to change output values. So the, the converter will repeat the number corresponding to zero volts uh, definitely, indefinitely. If you have a small DC offset in the signal, this will also use up some of the resolution. So this will reduce the number of bits available for the audio signal, um, and, it, and it therefore decreases the resolution, and distortion is increased as a result. At the very lowest level, a signal can also be effectively half-wave rectified, but this is only true for a, a signal less than a quantization step and if no dither is used. And we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to show an example of dither here in a minute. So this is a DC offset that's equivalent to one quarter of a quantization step. So dither is a small noise-like variation that's deliberately added to the audio signal at quantization. The dither amplitude is enough to keep the converter changing back and forth between steps, even in the absence of the signal. And in, in the digital domain, dither um, is always added at the least significant bit. So you toggle the least significant bit up and down by, by half a step. In an A to D converter, the analog input noise is often enough to act as a natural dither source. Dither improves the low-level linearity of the signal. Signals smaller than a quantization step are converted along with the dither noise. You can think of this as a modulated carrier. These buried in the noise signals are audible by the selective abilities of human hearing. Our brain is able to, to fish that um, signal out of the noise. It improves low-level distortion. So without dither, quantization error for low-level signals is correlated to the signal, uh, adding obvious distortion. Again, you can hear that, um, that quantization error. It also improves the low-level noise. It creates a, a defined noise floor, and the lowest signals fade to noise. They don't cut to silence. So here you can see, uh, this is a graph of um, a digital-to-digital -digital signal, and we're increasing the level of the signal and measuring uh, the output. As, and for a, a signal with dither, you can see that it's very linear. We get um, almost perfect correlation between input and output. But without the dither, the signal becomes nonlinear as the signal uh, goes below a certain level. So it greatly increases this linearity, causing a fade to noise instead of a cut to silence approach and it extends the dynamic range below the theoretical minimum level. These graphs are for uh, linearity of a 16-bit converter, which has a minus 96 dB limit, uh, 6 times 16. Dither causes the actual signal-to-noise ratios to be a few dB poorer than the theoretical value. So we're adding a little bit of noise um, but we're also, we're improving the, the sound of the signal, the audibility. 
So for a 16-bit word, the possible noise floor varies with the dither type. Typical numbers are uh, for 16 bits with no dither, minus 96 dB noise floor, and with triangular dither, uh, minus 92 dB. So triangular amplitude distribution dither, um, it's sometimes abbrevi abbreviated TPDF, triangular probability distribution function dither. And basically, you, you take the least significant bit of the converter and you toggle it, you, you fire it randomly in the negative direction and randomly in the positive direction. And by summing those two together, you get this TPDF or a triangular probability density function dither. Triangular dither linearizes the signal. So low-level signals without dither produce these harmonically related quantization errors. So these are at harmonics of the fundamental signal. And they're audible because they're not very far below the main signal. But this triangular dither randomizes the quantization error, producing a true noise floor and eliminating the quantization errors. So as I mentioned, um, it's called triangular probability dens density function dither, TPDF. And it's formed by adding two uniformly distributed random numbers, one in the positive direction, one in the ne negative direction. Ideal dither would result in uh, zero distortion, uh, zero noise modulation, and minimal added noise power of about 4.77 dB. So this is the probability uh, density function plot of this triangular dither. And that's why it's called triangular dither. So here I um, have a little example that I'm going to show. And what we're going to do is uh, play a very low level sine wave. And you can see uh, this is the scope display on the left and the FFT on the right. We're going to talk about FFTs next. I think Probably most of you have used FFTs to some degree before, fast Fourier transforms. So I'm going to switch over to the uh, to a live demo now. An APX 555 analyzer here. Which is our newest audio analyzer. Um, so I have a project file that I've saved called Dither Project. And what we're doing here is we're generating a signal um, through the digital unbalanced connector. So the way the APIC software works, we choose our uh, on this panel, our output configuration and our input configuration. So the output is digital. And um, here on the input side, I've chosen a loopback. So this is equivalent to taking an output cable and connecting it back into the input. But the analyzer does this internally um, if I check this box called loopback. If I uncheck the box, you'll see that I have a choice. So if I didn't want to use the internal loopback, I could just switch to uh, digital unbalanced and connect a cable. But it's more convenient to just use the loopback connector. So in this example, we're going to generate a sine signal. And the signal is at mini minus 80 decibels relative to full scale. So um, in the setup here, I'm showing that the sample rate is 48 kilohertz. And you can see uh, down here on these green on black indicators at the bottom that the incoming sample rate is 48 kilohertz. So I'm measuring a 48 kilohertz signal. And I've chosen a bit depth of 16 bits. And um, checking this box will automatically add dither to the signal. And uh, for now, I'm not going to check it. So let's. Um, the frequency of the sine wave that I'm generating is 440 hertz. So this. Uh, this sounds like a musical note. It's the, the uh, middle A on a piano. Um, I have also have a tuning fork, a device that you smack on the table, and, and it will resonate at 440 hertz. So I'm going to turn on the signal at minus 80. And you can see we're getting quite a bit of uh, quantization here. 
So um, currently interpolation is on. If I turn interpolation off, you can see here the, uh, the sampling instances are one over 48,000 seconds apart. And then you can see the staircase effect, which is caused by the quantization uh, with 16 bits. And then over here, I have the FFT spectrum. And let's make that a little bigger. And you can see that I have a lot of, um, so my fundamental signal here is at minus 80 decibels relative to full scale, but I have all of these discrete spikes in the signal. Now if I was to turn dither on, you'll notice that um, there's a change in the, in the scope display and there's also a change in the FFT display. So I, I brought the noise floor up, um, but I've reduced the level of those peaks that were standing out in the spectrum. And we can actually listen to this uh, if things work out properly. So in the, in the APX software, uh, we have a choice for this audible monitor. And what this does is um, it takes the signal coming into the analog, into the input of the analyzer, and you can choose uh, automatic gain, and you, you can choose the input signal or what's called the THD plus N residual. So for now, I'm gonna try just the, uh, the signal. So that's the signal with no dither. Can you hear that in the back? If I, I might turn it up a little bit. So you, you can see that it, uh, it sounds very um, harsh, very distorted. And if I turn on the dither, you can see that the noise floor comes up and it sounds much more musical of a tone. Uh, this is connected by a Bluetooth speaker, so there's a little bit of a delay here. So much more pleasant and much more musical sounding. The other thing that we can do here uh, with the audible monitor. So by default, we're listening to the, the input signal. That's the, the sine wave that's coming in. If I choose THD plus N residual, um, it passes the signal through a very steep notch filter, takes away the fundamental, and we're just listening to what's left called the residual. So let's try that now um, with no dither. So you can hear it's much more severely distorted. And if I turn the dither on, it's more of a noise-like signal. And then we'll switch back to the input signal. Okay. So that's the end of the demonstration. Any questions on that? All right, thank you. So, we, you know, we could also demonstrate the effect of quantization here by just playing with the bit depth. Um, let's undock this. So we have the, the scope display on the left showing the waveform. And um, here if I open this panel, I can change the bit depth. So if I go to, I'm at 16 bits, you'll notice now the noise floor here is about minus 135, minus 130 dB. If I go down in bit depth, you can see the noise floor coming up. And it comes up approximately 6 dB for every bit because e each bit doubles the resolution. That's 16, and if I go to 20 bits, just type in 2-0, you can see the noise floor drops, and if we were to go to 24, we would drop to the level of uh, typical professional audio, 24 bits. And if I remove the dither, you can see there are still, still some discrete peaks in the spectrum, but they're, of course, at a much lower level. Okay.
So this topic is uh, FFT analysis. FFT stands for Fast Fourier Transform. And this is a very, uh, very important topic in audio test be because we, we tend to use sine waves to test audio devices because a sine is very pure signal. It's, it's as simple as a signal can get. And uh, a pure sine wave shows up as a single frequency in the spectrum. So this makes FFT analysis a very important tool for us. For example, you can see here, this is a representation of a 1 kilohertz sine wave um, at about minus, minus 16 decibels relative to 1 volt. And of course we have harmonics showing up at um, multiples of the fundamental frequency. So the FFT is a very good tool for showing this. I know that in uh, acoustics you're more accustomed to using fractional octave analysis um, because the quite often the signals that you're dealing with are very random and very noise-like um, and an FFT would be too much resolution but for audio signals because we use sine waves it's it's a very powerful tool so the, the basics I'm not going to go into the math too much um, probably you've, you've taken this in university before but Essentially, you acquire uh, a number of samples of the measured quantity over a period of time, and then you transform the measured data to determine its frequency spectrum. So we saw in the previous um, demo that we have a, a time domain or an oscilloscope representation of the signal which shows the, um, the waveform as an XY plot of the, of the waveform. And then the frequency domain, the, the spectrum analyzer view, shows the, um, the frequency of the data ca calculated using an FFT or fast Fourier transform. This is plotted as amplitude versus frequency. So the total time in the acquisition varies with the number of samples and the sample rate. So we have these uh, standard sample rates of 48 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz, and so on. And then we have, um, in our analyzers, we refer to it as the FFT length, but it's the number of samples in the acquisition before it's transformed to the frequency domain. So typical acquisition lengths, uh, for example, 16K or um, 16384 would be, to determine the acquisition length, you would divide by the sample rate. So 16K samples over 48K is about 0.341 seconds and so on. So the possible numbers of samples in the acquisition and the sample rates vary um, with the capabilities of the analyzer in use. Our older legacy instruments had a maximum um, FFT length, I think, of 256K. And our um, current platform, um, we have up to 1.2 million uh, samples in the FFT. So um, quite often, it's very common to have um, FFT lengths that are uh, 2 to the power of n, 2 raised to some integer, such as 256, 512, 1K, and so on. And then um, we've recently added sample rates that are um, integer divisors of the, of, I'm sorry, FFT lengths that are integer divisors of the sample rate. So for example, if you're... Um, sample rate is 12 kilohertz and you have a 12k FFT length, then the resolution in the frequency domain would be 1 hertz. So each FFT bin would be 1 hertz wide. And uh, as I mentioned in our, our current APX platform, uh, this list goes all the way up to 1.2 million points. Now this topic is on uh, what we call synchronous FFTs. So the, the fast Fourier transform assumes that the signal is periodic in time. So when you acquire the signal into um, an acquisition, it assumes that the, the signal begins and ends um, and continues that way on for infinity in both directions. And uh, when that is true, um, you get a very clean FFT with razor sharp spikes in it. So this, um, in the case of sine waves, if, if the sine waves begin and end right in the data block, you get this um, 
this phenomenon that's called a synchronous uh, sampling and a synchronous FFT. In other words, the, the signal is in sync with the acquisition length. So it, it has to fit exactly into the sample length and they, the waves have to start at a zero crossing and end at a zero crossing. For this special case, the FFT shows only these spikes um, and real data is almost never like this. So certainly in the case of acoustics, this would never happen. It does happen in certain cases in audio. Um, and if we use a special signal like this called a multitone, we can control the acquisition by forcing it to be synchronous with the acquisition. For most signals, the acquisition length will not match the periods of the waveform exactly. Um, so you get this phenomenon where the signal um, doesn't start at a zero crossing. And th this would be true of real world signals like music and noise as well. So if you try to do an FFT of this, uh, you get a very distorted spectrum, such as these red curves on the right. Um, you get these tent shaped curves and uh, this phenomenon where it curves at, at a low level below the peaks is called scalloping. Uh, this would occur between tones in a multitone signal. So to, to overcome this problem, we use a technique called windowing, uh, FFT windowing. And the, the windowing allows us to see uh, more of the detail and more of the noise floor and removes this um, skirting problem. So the, the FFT window um, essentially takes the signal which is not periodic and multiplies it by a, s a function like this in shown in the red that begins at zero uh, with zero slope and ends at zero as well with a smooth taper. Um, so when you multiply the original signal by this window, you get a windowed acquisition that looks like the curve at the bottom. And that forces the signal to be periodic within um, the acquisition block. This is another um, example here. So you can see the blue trace is the original signal and then we've applied this window. I believe in this case it's a, a window called a hand window. In, in our AP, APX software we refer to it as a hand window named after the mathematician who came up with a window. You'll quite often hear that um, called a Hanning window by other analyzers. So again, the windowing uh, tapers the signal and forces it to be periodic. And instead of this uh, tent-shaped curve, you get a better estimate of the FFT. Now these uh, windowing functions, they, they do work, but they end up um, spreading the energy from a single spike. So if we had a signal that was, was synchronous um, with the acquisition window, it would show up as a single spike, but when you apply this window, it spreads the energy into ad adjacent bins. So you have to be aware of that when you use the windows, and you have to choose windows appropriately. These different windows um, have the different window functions have different uh, characteristics that can be traded off. So these are some samples of windows that are available in, in our APX software. And you can see they have different uh, levels of side lobes. Um, for example, this window shown in red has much higher side lobes than this one here. They also have a different selectivity. And they, they have different um, parameters in terms of the peak amplitude accuracy, how accurately they can estimate the peak. So these are some of the uh, parameters used to state the window performance. This column lists the window type, the amplitude error, and the side lobe attenuation. So um, the amplitude error is, what that determines is if, if I'm measuring a signal, um, if, the, if the frequency is exactly at the center frequency of the bin of the FFT, I should get a perfect result. But that rarely happens in practice. The, the generator might be slightly off or the sample rate might change a little bit. 
and it's very uncommon to get the signal to line up perfectly with the center of an FFT bin. So the amplitude error shows the maximum error that, you would, that would occur uh, when, you're, when you're using that window. So for example, um, if you're trying to use a, a sound level calibrator, you would choose a window like this flat top window. What this does is it spreads the energy into adjacent bands and gives you a very accurate representation. So um, if the frequency of your cali calibrator is off a little bit, it's not going to matter because it will, it will give you the best estimate of the amplitude um, at the signal. But the trade-off for that is um, it does not have very good performance for side lobe attenuation. So you would have big side lobes but accurate uh, center bin. Whereas the equal ripple window, this is the one that we use by default in the APX software, it doesn't have very good amplitude error, but the side lobe attenuation is very high. A difference of uh, 147 versus 92. So um, there's a variety of windows available um, depending on the application. Most people don't use very many of them. Um, often if you just use our, our default, it works well for sine waves. If you're analyzing noise signals, you might choose, um, say, the hand window. And then um, for applications where you're trying to estimate the amplitude of a signal, you would use the flat top window. If that's your main purpose. Now, um, FFT averaging can improve the the ratio of measured signal to noise. So in this graph, um, you can see we have a signal with a, a fairly high noise floor. And the, the trace in the back would be measured by just one acquisition. Um, and as you can see, there's a large variation in the noise here. The signal fluctuates um, quite widely uh, at the noise floor. And the, the solid colored trace is um, an average of the spectrum. So what we've done is um, taken multiple FFTs and averaged them together. And as you do that, the, um, the noise signal um, approaches its mean value. So you can improve the visibility of the noise floor by taking many averages. So um, this technique where you average the FFTs after you've um, transform the data is called power averaging. So we're averaging in the frequency domain. It's normally used to statistically reduce the variation due to noise. You acquire a number of FFT spectra and compute the, the mean value for each bin and then show the result. This makes the true frequency signal components more obvious and it makes it easier to estimate the mean amplitude of the noise floor. Now there's another technique uh, called FFT synchronous averaging and this is used when you're trying to look for discrete signals um, in the presence of noise. So if you have a, a sine signal and you want to look at artifacts of that sine wave, um, the fundamental frequency and components, harmonic components of it, you can use what's called synchronous averaging. So this technique um, aligns the signal using a trigger. So you want to be sure that you always trigger on the start uh, a certain point in the sine waveform. And then you average the signals in the time domain. And what happens is the, the components that are uh, synchronous with the fundamental frequency get reinforced and the noise averages out because the noise is not related to the fundamental frequency. So this can reduce the noise level below the statistical mean value while preserving the level of the components that are synchronized with the main uh, trigger signal. Synchronous averaging is used to find spectral features that are below the level of the noise, but it does require a well-defined waveform and it has to be synchronous and you need a, a trigger signal uh, to acquire the waveform. So in this example, uh, the trace in the back is a, a spectral signal. And as you can see, uh, th th this is the same signal with and without synchronous averaging. So in the back, you can see the noise floor is at a, about 150 dB, minus 150. 
And the pink signal, or the red signal, uh, the noise floor is about minus 180. And we can see this spectral component that was not present without the synchronous averaging. So for each doubling of the uh, number of averages, the noise floor is reduced by about three decibels. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to uh, demonstrate that those two different averaging types, if I may. So let's look at the APX software. And what we'll do here is um, turn off the generator. And let's um, let's change to uh, analog balanced out. Also choose a loop back. And I'll change this to, uh, let's say, 2 volts RMS. And let's make this one kilohertz signal. Actually, let's choose that um, 997. So the so the um, bandwidth here is uh, 90 kilohertz. So we're looking at signals between DC and 90 kilohertz, and um, at this bandwidth, the sample rate, we have um, analog to digital converters built into the analyzer. At this bandwidth, the sample rate is 192K. So I'm choosing 997 because it's not uh, a sub-multiple of 192 kilohertz. So let's turn on the generator and let's have a look at um, THD plus N ratio, which is the uh, Distortion, a measure of total harmonic distortion plus noise. And let's set that in decibels. So um, this is our DAC generator. And uh, we can switch over to the high performance sign generator, which is an RC oscillator. And you can see this distortion goes way down. And then we have this thing called the high performance sign analyzer. And uh, the signal goes down even more. The, sorry, the distortion goes down even more. So let's go back to the DAC generator and uh, let's have a look at those two types of averaging. So let me uh, minimize this panel and let's go to the um, FFT measurement. So this is similar to the live meters, but it's going to acquire signals um, and just keep them on the screen. So we'll try just one average at 16K, and we get a signal. Um, so if I was, you can see that the, uh, the noise floor here, I'll sw switch the units to uh, decibels relative to one volt. You can see the noise floor here is quite scattered looking, and if I choose uh, a number of averages, say 10, Actually, I'm going to let me just switch to one channel so that there's less uh, data on the screen. And I'll just repeat that with one, one average. So here we have uh, one average, or which would in fact is no averaging. Now if I check append here and turn on, say, uh, I don't know, eight, and do a power average, you can see um, the second signal, the noise floor is being averaged to its mean value versus um, the first one where uh, there's no averaging going on. So it's, it's a much better representation of the mean value of the noise floor. And then if I wanted to try the uh, synchronous averaging, what I need to do is I need a trigger so I can trigger on the generator. And what this means is um, the first sample acquired will be synchronized with the start of the generator. So let's try um, one signal again. Sorry, one, one average, which is no averaging. And 
Now if I choose, say, two averages, it's pretty hard to see. Let's go to, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> my mistake. I, I meant to change this to synchronous averaging. So let me, um, I'm going to clear data, measure two, and I'll turn this to synchronous averaging. So now what it's going to do is average the signal in the time domain, and then um, parts of the signal that are synchronous with the sine wave will get reinforced but noise signals that are riding on top of the sine wave, uh, sometimes they're positive and sometimes they're negative, so they'll tend to cancel out. So let's look at uh, two averages with synchronous averaging. And you can see the noise floor is at slightly lower. If I zoom in here, it'll be a little easier to see. Let's go to four averages. And if I go to Let's try 16. So it's a little difficult uh, to see with everything on the screen, but let me uh, turn off these two traces. So as you can see, um, that was one average with synchronous averaging and then 16 averages with synchronous averaging. So for each doubling of the number of averages, it brings the noise floor down. So this is a good technique if you have um, discrete components that are buried in noise. For example, um, some of the, some of the um, digital to analog converters available today have a very low noise floor. Um, and um, even the 555 with its excellent performance you know, can be taxed by some of these devices. So this is a technique where you can look for distortion components that are below the noise floor. Um, but it's not a good te technique for estimating the noise floor. Just need to make that clear. Okay. Thank you for the question. So the question was, uh, could, could we talk a little bit about signal to noise ratio and the FFT noise floor, what it looks like in the, in the noise floor? Sure. So um, let's do that. So at, um, where's my generator panel here? So we're at two volts RMS, zero volts DC. So one of the things we can do, um, a good way to look at this is to, um, we wanna know the level of the noise relative to the level of the signal, right? Um, so our generator's set at two volts RMS and uh, there's, a, there's a tool we have called references so uh, we have these references called DBRA, DBRB, which are just convenient uh, references you can use. And one of the things, so that the generator's on right now, if I look at um, RMS level, let me add a meter here for RMS level. It's a two volts RMS. Um, so if I set this reference, so this shows the measured level and the frequency, and if I set A to the current value, it's gonna set what's called the DBRA reference. And now I can look at the signal in terms of um, units of DBRA. So, uh, it doesn't look quite right. There we go. So I've set the DBRA reference to the current measured voltage, which is two volts RMS. And you can see that the, uh, the unit of the RMS level is in uh, DBRA. Um, and if I wanted to look at the, so the uh, THT plus N ratio, um, what this d does is it removes the fundamental, the main sine wave, and uh, adds up all of the remaining harmonic components plus the noise. So it's the ratio of distortion plus noise to the main signal. So another way to look at this is the uh, THD plus N level, and then I can express this in units of DBRA. So you can see the main signal is at zero dB relative uh, DBRA, 
and the uh, THD plus N level is minus 101. So the ratio of those two is uh, minus 101. So, um, so what you would do here to measure the signal to noise ratio is you would measure your signal and um, get your, your level and then you would turn off the generator and measure the noise and that's uh, minus 120. So the signal to noise ratio in this case would be um, zero relative to minus 120. So zero minus 120 is about 120 dB of signal to noise. Do you mean in, in, in the FFT signal? Okay, so, uh, so if we go back to um, FFT here, and let's just uncheck this and do a few averages. Let's try, say, four averages. So, um, so you're saying if you express the spectrum in DBRA like this, doesn't look, there we go. That was interesting. So the, the main signal is at zero dBRA, and you're wanting to know how does this relate to the signal-to-noise ratio? Yeah, that's right. So I think the question is, um, it, when I measure the FFT, I see the signal at zero dBRA here, and the noise floor appears to be at minus 155. Why doesn't that agree with the measured signal-to-noise ratio? Is that, is that your question? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, it, it turns out that if you, um, there, are, there are many thousands of points in the FFT spectrum, right? And if you were to um, add them all up correctly, the sum of all of that, um, all of the values excluding the fundamental would add up to the proper noise floor. What happens is, I, I can show you how this works. Um, so let, let's do maybe, let's try, eight, I'll just try something greater, like eight averages. So if I do eight averages, it looks like my noise floor is close to minus 160, right? Let me, um, what happens is if I go to some higher resolution, like 64K, and repeat the measurement. Oh, I turned off my trace. That's why it's not visible. So I have to turn it back on. So y you'll notice that the noise floor appears to be lower in, in the red trace than it does in the blue trace, right? By the same token, if I go down to uh, something like 4K, I have to turn that trace back on as well. Oops. So in this trace, the noise floor looks higher than it did before. So the, the appearance of the noise floor in the spectrum um, is highly related to the, the number of points that you've selected. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be using the board. I'm supposed to use my mouse. It, it's really... Um, it's really correlated with the number of points that you've included in the spectrum. So if you look at the underlying data here, um, this shows you by default the number of points is the same as the graph. If you look at all the points, so if you took all of this data and you added it up, um, you have to use what's called the window scaling factor. So the window um, modifies the data and in order to add up the points properly, you have to take account of, of this thing called the window scaling factor. Um, looks like it's not making much sense to you. I have a, I can show you an article on our website. Um, so this is a, it's a very important uh, topic and I hope you don't mind me taking a minute because um, in our technical support <coughs> department, we, um, we often get people asking this question. So if we go to ap.com, and uh, some of you may not know this, but if you go to uh, service and support, there's an area called knowledge base. 
and uh, there's a little search window here. Um, it's we're improving our website um, this year, I believe. So the, the search engine isn't the greatest, but um, there's a topic. If you search for uh, FFT and noise, there's an article that explains all this. Oops, I misspelled noise. Yeah, it's called FFT Scaling for Noise. And um, let's see, hold on a second. So this is an article that tells you um, just exactly what we're talking about. So this is a signal measured at two different FFT resolutions, and you, you can see that apparently they have a different noise floor. This explains um, how that happens, and these window scaling factors. So there's a formula in here. Um, if you want to estimate the noise in a spectrum, you have to take the sum of the bin values squared divided by this thing called the noise power bandwidth. And that's just a constant that depends on the type of window that you've used. So if you use this formula, you'll, you'll get exactly the same result uh, in the, in the signal-to-noise ratio calculation. Does that make sense? I think if you read the article, uh, it, it'll, it'll be clear, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I get that question a lot. So um, that's how it works. Okay, thank you for the question. Yeah, so th this uh, talks about actually the, that same question you just asked, the interpretation of noise in FFT power spectra. So the APX signal analyzer is calibrated uh, so that the amplitude axis gives the correct reading for sine waves. Um, but if you want to an analyze noise signals, you have to take into account this window correction factor. So it, it can't be used as an indicator of the level of spectrally non-discrete signals like noise without applying this correction factor um, that depends on the bin width and the window being used. So these are these uh, correction factors. And uh, you don't really need to know these unless you want to take the FFT data and do calculations on it. Some of you may wish to do that. It's a very powerful feature. You can create your own digital filters by analyzing the FFT data. Um, but if you don't need to do that, you don't need to bother with this. So the, uh, there are two other measurements that we have uh, called the power spectral density and the amplitude spectral density. So this normalizes that the data, uh, normalizes the data to that which would be measured with a bin width of one hertz exactly and it applies the window correction factor. So you can take the, these functions. The, uh, the amplitude spectral density is related to the power spectral density. It's just the square root. And really, they're used to find um, the, an estimate of the signal between two frequencies. So if you use these functions, you, they already have the bin width and the, um, this window correction factor built in. So you can do calculations on the amplitude spectral density correctly, uh, directly. Uh, this amplitude spectral density is typically used for comparison of operational amplifiers where uh, they use units of volts per square root of hertz, which seems kind of confusing, but that's the way it is. I think that's the end of uh, this session. <laughs>